Hello everyone, welcome to episode 619 of Aussie Tech Eds. It's another week and another great hunk of stories for you to listen to and hear our opinions of and, and whatever else we do with these things. Uh, it's the 7th of February 2019 and uh, we welcome you all. We are brought to you by athwebhosting.com.au. It's a drag and drop website builder. The server operates on the SSD drives, immediate activation, SSL certificates, Aussie support, domain registration, easily install WordPress, Joomla and Drupal and heaps more. ATH web hosting.com.au and startnewcompany.com.au you can register your company with ASIC fast easy and direct so once you uh, put all your information in uh, the outcome is you'll get the your company will be registered you'll have your certificate of registration and all your constitution and minutes and shareholders agreements and all this sort of stuff uh, so uh, jump on to startnewcompany.com.au and they tell me coming soon ABN TFN and trust so uh, how good's that stuff uh, also, don't you? Well, you can uh, find us also on the internet at youtube.com forward slash Aussie Tech Eds and facebook.com forward slash Aussie Tech Eds. Uh, you can get us all over the show <laughs> um, at Aussie Tech Eds at Glenn Goodman on Twitter. Uh, don't forget, other shows on the network is the Aussie Max Zone and the My Tech Opinion. I don't know what these guys are doing there. They haven't had a show for a while, but uh, I'll find out what's going on this week. All right, let's uh, find out who the, our co-hosts are this week. And we've got a bit of a surprise in a second for you. Uh, but first of all, let's say hello to Joe. How you going, Joe? Hey, Gideon. How you going? Yeah, good. How, how's your week been? Yeah, it's been pretty good. That's the way. That's the way. And uh, Jordan. Hello, Jordan. How are you, mate? Yeah, how are you? I'm good. I finally made it. I might be a bit short on stories, but I made it. That's all right. You got your air conditioner in this week. I was busy getting the air conditioner in right before the show started, so I'm, I'm still. It hasn't cooled down yet. Right. Good. I'm, good. I'm a bit short on stories. That's we'll all be right. right. Oh, we'll, we'll, we'll wing it as we always do. <laughs> you, you can do. You can do Tim's story. He's got one about that cryptocurrency that got hacked. Oh, didn't someone die? Yeah, we'll get into that. Someone died or something, and they took their password right. with them. Oh, but, that was the one I posted to you this week, Joe. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, okay. So this week we got a special guest. Uh, you, I know you. Oh, all... thanks. I'm, I'm here every week. What are you talking about? Uh, extra special, more special than you. <laughs> it's uh, it's Ian Davidson from a place called GoFar.co. How are you going, Ian? I'm going very well, Glenn. How are you doing? Yeah, not too bad, thank you. It's, it's uh, great to see you. Um, you're from GoFar. Now, I, I suppose we better find out what that's all about. Uh, I had a quick look at your webpage, which I'll put up in a second. But uh, can you tell us what GoFar is all about? Um, I can, yeah. It's basically a, a little device. It's about the size of a matchbox. Um, and uh, it's a personal assistant for your car. So it plugs into the car's diagnostic port. And a lot of people don't realize that their car has a diagnostic port, but it kind of lives somewhere under the steering wheel and above your knees, um, sort of down in that dark sort of footwell. Right. Um, and it, if you plug something in, then you can access the data on the car. Um, and what we do with that is we, we help uh, kind of use that data to protect the car. So it will tell you if there's something wrong with your car instantly. And instead of you just getting a, kind of a strange flashing red light, you'll actually get a text or an alert on your phone and it will explain what the error code is, uh, the problem and the severity. Right. Um, so you can then be sort of forewarned and forearmed when you're dealing with a mechanic. Um, we will remind you when your rego's due, um, you know, your servicing, your insurance, oh. pumping up your tires. We protect the drivers as well. Um, yeah. So we're doing a project down here in New South Wales at the moment um, reducing accidents and speeding amongst young drivers. I think as soon as you qualify to drive, um, I think, you know, whilst that strictly speaking is saying that you've met the minimum standard to be safe in a car, I think a lot of people seem to think they've won the Formula One World Championship. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, so we've, uh, yeah, we're, we're working, we're giving drivers real-time feedback um, on their driving we have a little extra bit to go far that sits on your dash. When it's blue, everything's good. You're driving safely, efficiently, and you're below the speed limit. And when it starts to, to glow a little bit red um, or full-on angry red, yeah. you're doing something wrong. You're wasting money. You're speeding. You're going to get a ticket. So um, we've been working with, with the New South Wales government um, helping young drivers, and we've reduced their, uh, their harsh speeding by over 30%. Right, um, right. And that should have a direct impact on saving lives. 
I remember, um, yeah, so I was just going to say, I remember when I was learning to drive, my dad always used to tell me, you got to pretend you had an egg between your foot and the accelerator. And that was yes. that was a tip <laughs> from my dad. But um, yeah, so, so that's all right now. I know, so it fits this little device, fits most cars. Yeah, pretty much any car um, in Australia since 2006. Um, so about, yeah, about 13 years worth of cars. Right. Because I know uh, for, for, it would be, wouldn't it, that I put my car into it and it didn't didn't re- recognise my car. But that's only because mine was a, I've got this little um, Nissan Cube. I don't know if you've ever seen one of those little things. Yeah, okay. And, and so um, I, I think I had to go and make sure it was uh, post two thousand and three and had some sort of special specification or something but um right yeah but I'm, i'll have a look at the other car and uh see if it's uh it's compatible because it's a ford so it'll, it will be but yeah so it looks really uh interesting and like and surprisingly for me anyway it wasn't uh, it didn't cost too much it was like for that little device that plugs into the uh your car for your diagnostics i think is that like 99 dollars uh, yeah, it's at ninety nine dollars um, if you're just buying the adapter, mm. and if you're buying the adapter and the the ray, which is what we call the uh, uh, the display. Oh yes, um, then that's one hundred and twenty nine dollars at the moment. Yes, yeah. So that's um that's that's pretty good. And I think even if you wanted to buy, what's that? You can buy two and get one free as well. So that's all right. Yeah, so we got a few, a few sort of extra deals on there as well. Uh, the other stuff that it does, as well as kind of protecting the car and the driver, is um, it saves you time and money, and it even does your tax for you. So we we have a lot of our customers use it for. You know, I think one of the one of the chores up there that's kind of seems to be on a par with going to the dentist mm. is if you have to keep a logbook yes. um, for for work driving. Uh, a lot of people prefer just not to get the money because it's yeah. just so painful. Also, they might just kind of claim on mileage, mm. uh, which is yeah, you don't get as much money back. Because we will will log all your trips automatically, um, you can just tag them as business by swiping the trips in the app. Mm. Um, then you just export your data to the accountant. You've got a pretty full um, you know, full tax claim. Yeah, you're right, um, because I remember when I was doing it, you know, in the old days, I guess, you know, you'd get, you have to go to the news agent, buy a logbook, and then yep. you know, how many times did I write in that? End up just, I think there was a, a setting in the tax or a, a thing in the tax that you could just claim five thousand k's or something. Yeah, you know. that's the one. Yeah, yeah. and you might did. That's might much have, better for them. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, so that, that's pretty cool. Hey, um, Ian, you know that um, that glow ray thing you got there? That reminds me of the old eighties there, where we had a uh, little red light coming up on the dash when you put your foot down too far. Does that work similar to that? Oh, he's frozen. Uh, but anyway, we'll, he'll, he'll unfreeze in a minute. No one else is frozen, are they? No, I seem to be okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so anyway, well, let's, uh, we'll wait for Ian to come back. He might yeah. have to... I should re- say, I reckon, I reckon I've seen a commercial in the past for GoFar. I think Ian has probably had this product around for a while now. I reckon I saw a commercial many, many years ago about something that looks similar. They put it on the dashboard to regulate, regulate your speeding or something or... Something like that to yeah, make sure you're possibly. speeding. Hmm. Here he maybe, is. Maybe Ian will come back. Here, Here he is. is. I was just sending you a, a text. <laughs> you you froze for some reason. Yeah, I don't know. I've, I've got the new Pixel Three, um, and it's giving me uh, giving me sort of messages saying um, how hot it is, and it oh. may shut down. Is you know non-essential tasks. Oh, like wow. Live, live podcast will just shut no, that down. I wouldn't a, yeah. have guessed that you're on a Pixel. Anyway, that's a that's I, I didn't even realize it was a phone. So that's a good. It's it's actually it's it's not too bad. It's a significant upgrade on the Pixel too. I think. Yeah. Um, I noticed. I noticed when I go onto the site that you know the the instant chat messenger comes up and it says uh, speak with Ian. Is that actually you? <laughs> it, it, not right now. It isn't. No, just, to um, ask, just to ask him and see if he replies, Glenn. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I was I was doing that. I was in an Uber the other day, and um, I was like talking to rideshare drivers because they got a lot of car costs, and they need to sort of track their mileage and um, you know get their fuel costs down. So we can help with all that. And I was sort of, I find if I, if you tell people about the product and you say you work there, you know, it's it's just not that credible. So I was, I was sort of explaining, oh yeah, I've got a friend and he's doing this thing, and you know, it's like kind of car tech. Hmm. Yeah, what, what do you think of that? And he's like, oh, it sounds really interesting. 
Yeah. Um, I was picking up my son from school and then I was going to stay in the Uber and t- uh, t- uh, both head home. Uh, and so he was there. And whilst I was just picking up my son, you know, he, uh, he just jumped straight on the website. And, um, yeah, my ugly face pops up on the live <laughs> chat. He's like, is that you? It's like, yeah, yeah, that's me. <laughs> so just just one last uh, thing, I guess. Um, is we, we obviously you buy them on on the web, but can you buy them in the shops? Are they out in the in the wilderness, or is it just online? Uh, you can get them on Super Cheap Auto on their website. Uh, I think we're going to end up in the shops pretty soon, and you can uh, you can get them on Amazon, uh, eBay, I think. But uh, uh, we're a pretty new company, so at the moment, yeah, not, not a lot of uh, not a lot of extra distribution. Yeah, it's just when. Uh, how long has the company been going for, Ian? Um, we've been developing it for quite a while, um, but we've only really been in market for a little bit over a year. Oh, right. right. So I was just saying to Glenn when you dropped out there before that I'm sure I'd seen a commercial on TV or a current affair or something something like that regarding the GoFar, but mm. maybe I haven't if it's only a new company. But there was something back then that looked very similar that helped to regulate the kids with their speed and that sort of stuff in the car and how fast they were driving and things like that. Now, yes. Sorry, Ian, you can respond to that. Yeah, yeah. So I think with the, I mean, it's, it's interesting with kids because, you know, there's, there's a lot of confidence, I think, with, with most drivers, um, especially with kids. Um, and um, so when we first started GoFire, it was very much around sort of driver behavior. Um, and actually, it's kind of a bad idea. You know, like we, we can improve how people drive. Um, we can sort of help save lives even. Um, but it's really hard telling someone that they're anything other than an awesome driver. Um, but so we've sort of changed sort of, our, sort of how, we're, how we're going about this now. So we do give real-time feedback on your driving as we drive. That does seem to be the most effective way to do it. And it's pretty simple. It, you, know, you keep your eyes on the road. The, the dash to the display just glows red or blue. Um, and people, you know, if they want to change their driving behavior, to save money on fuel, um, they, they ought to be safer, they, they can do so. But um, I think it, the stats are about 85% of people think they're above average when it comes to driving skill. Yeah. So <laughs> it's uh, going out there, and kids, especially the especially young males, we we don't have a great appreciation of risk when we're younger. I, I don't know how it doesn't get that much better when we're older. No, um, no, I don't so, think so. I, I remember so, just with that, Mike, with your headphone, just give that a little twiddle. Please, Ian. It's just coming through a bit staticky for some reason. All of a sudden. Oh, no, that looks. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I know. Like when I first got my license, I think when you know one of the first things I did was, yeah, you tear around the place, don't you? <laughs> you, you do mellow. You do mellow. Um, yeah. That, yes. I think my nephew lost his license within three days. Oh, right. Well, that's no good. How no, long? That's quick. Yeah. 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 But his yeah. license and three days later it was Just gone. Just a little bit more about the um, alerts the car gets from the system. What kind of what kind of alerts we expect to sort of see from that system? Uh, sure. So it's plugged into the onboard diagnostic system, um, and so um, pretty much any engine error um, uh, that you know the, that the car system picks up, um, it will pick up any code. Um, where we're able, we're able to decode the 300 most common codes, um, and we'll explain. I think about 3,000, 3,000 codes will tell you what the problem is, and then you can kind of go onto Doctor Google and find out um, a little bit more about that if you need to. And the motivation for that was just, I, I used to go into the mechanic, and I'm just a lamb to the slaughter. Mm. Um, yeah, most of us yeah, they know they know so much, and you know, I'm not I'm not a complete tech luddite. But it's, you know, it's just an, un, it's an, it's more like a hostage situation, I think. <laughs> so I, I drop off the car um, and they say, see ya, I'll give you a call. They call you when you're in the office uh, and they then tell you how much you're going to pay. And no one, no one ever says, that's an outrage. I'm coming straight to the garage. I'm going to ruin my day. Um, pick up the car, take it somewhere else where they're going to do exactly the same thing. That's right. Yeah. But if you, if you have more of an idea what's wrong with the car, before you drop it off, you can call a couple of places. Mm. Um, you, know, you can get you know, get um, a little bit of a sense of who's going to be best to deal with. To, to um, get Glenn, I don't want to interrupt you there, but you need to not flick to the web pages because when you do, the audio is cutting out apparently, and people can't hear what anything. Oh, okay. 
No worries. So maybe go back to back to Ian's face. <laughs> yeah, no, it'll be right on the YouTube. Don't worry about it. Okay. But I'll okay. I'll change that right now. There you go. Um, yeah. So uh, so with <coughs> the the diagnostics, did you have this? It, does, is each model and make of car uh, does that have their own diagnostic codes, or is there a, some sort of standard throughout the the, the ranges? Um, it, it, it's both. Um, so there's a, a very big set of standard codes. Um, and then there's um, it, it probably a similar size set of proprietary codes. Right. Um, and so you'll get something what's called a PID, a PID, um, and um, that will be a four-digit, uh, one-letter, four-digit code. Um, and so we can then sort of translate that code, look it up against a, a, a database of, of, of uh titles and then start to kind of describe what the problem might be you know, if it's a high severity problem high impact i, I stop the car now mm. uh, get out run um or uh, or if it's like yeah, okay don't worry about it but you know you can get this sorted out at the next you know the next time you get the car serviced or you know you've got a couple of weeks you know but you know, don't don't ignore it yeah um, and so it's just a case of being you know i, I think a lot of these tech solutions around empowering you know the the customer with with a bit more data it's not going to solve all your problems i mean you're, you're still going to need mechanics because yeah. you know, mechanics know stuff you don't know they got to fix the thing um so but you're more forewarned you're forearmed and it helps you just have a, a better conversation i can't think of any negotiation that you ever go into where having more information hurts you no no um I so uh I, I think it just you know it's just about sort of helping the customer get a little bit more of a leg up on that on that sort of conversation with the mechanic um and feeling more confident in that when you've um i just noticed here i've got the the on the website i'm pretty sure the audio is coming through so hopefully it is i'll just quickly flash there but on the uh on the app uh you've got you know time till service and all this sort of stuff now yeah, uh, who that is that must be an editable field. Like you can manually put in something. So if you're not happy with your six month, you go, I don't believe in six month service. I want to change that to twelve months. Um, yeah, absolutely. So you can you can sort of put it in put in your target. Um, otherwise, we will um, we're working on an integration at the moment actually where we will uh, just automatically um, assess when your car next needs the service. Because right. uh, we will log, we'll follow the odometer readings um, as they go up, and then we'll know that you know the Mazda three you know needs a this kind of service um, on eighty thousand kilometers, mm. and then you know, here's here's some options. Um, so what we want to do is actually sort of not just highlight the information, but we'd ideally like to solve the problem for you as well. If you, you know, give you some options, I think what I found with my own behaviour was. I'd go to the garage and you know, get the car serviced, and then I'd, as I was driving home the next day, cursing because I'd have to leave the office at you know four o'clock because they shut at five. Yes, um, and I paid the money and I just gritted my teeth, you know, because like, what are you going to do? Yeah, well, that's um, right. And then I probably I'm never going to do that again. <laughs> What's know, never again? What's and then the next year I do the same thing because I leave it till the yes. last minute. Yeah, the yeah. rego's due. I've got to yeah. get some inspection done, and it's all too late. So we're trying to again get you on the front foot, but then show you where the good local mechanics are, um, so that you can see the ratings. You get a fixed price service quote, right. um, and again, you know, it's it's not just giving you the data; it's actually trying to solve the problem, and make it easier to manage your car. We haven't done that yet. We've done a little bit of test work on it, um, and we had yeah, sixty percent of the people who we did quotes for. Oop, we've lost your audio. Lost lost his audio. <laughs> Yeah, it, it looks it. like um, uh, you've got. There's not a lot of loyalty to 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 the to the mechanic. No, but there's a lot of apathy. There's a lot, same with insurance companies. I don't think these are. It's not the company that we love, um, but it's just painful changing. Now, um, yeah, on the app, I hear the tire pressure. How how is, does that work? Is that just assume that the the uh, the tire pressure just needs checking, or how how does that? Um, work? So it's a pretty simple system, actually, but quite effective. So what I have mine set up to do is every 60 days, it just says pump up your tires. Right. Um, should be pumping up my tires probably once a month, maybe maybe more, but like I, I just don't. No. Uh, you can actually so, get sensors that go in the tube. Um, yeah, you, they, yeah. So some some so, of the newer cars will will have the sensors, um, like like Joe says, um, 
And um, my car, I'm driving a 2005 Mazda 3, uh, which is pretty old school. Um, so for me, it's just a- acting as, a, as, a, as an aid memoir, really, as, as a, to jog my memory. Um, and I'm still surprised how infrequently I pump up the tires. Um, so it's costing so me about were, 3% so on fuel. If you were to go out and buy one of these aftermarket sensors or any aftermarket equipment, could you actually yeah. add onto this system? Will it work with it? Or did it- um, not, not at the moment, no. We sort of looked at um, tire sensors um, and it's, it's one of those things sort of it's possibly an opportunity. Um, but the, the, in this case, the low tech solution it's got a dodgy audio port there. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, just pump them up on a regular basis. Actually, works very well. Mm. Now, uh, you've got what? Can you tell us about autonomous cars? You got some uh, experience with those, or any knowledge about what we're going to expect? <laughs> uh, look, it, so we're not in the autonomous space. We're more in the sort of connect. You have the space is now called CAV, C A V, connected and autonomous vehicles. We'd be more on the K. Uh, and less on the AV, um, <laughs> yeah. but we yeah, we talk to people in the in the AV space as well, and it is really interesting. So you have this sort of hype cycle with any new technology, um, and I think autonomous cars, you know, last year and the year before were like really very much in the hype cycle, um, you know, the um, the the peak of expectations, mm. and so I think we were all expecting by now. I mean, maybe by you know March, let's say. Uh, that we would all be sort of going around in in flying driverless cars, and it, and it's outrageous because it's not happened. Um, and now I think we're sort of getting into sort of more realistic sort of expectations. Um, the the estimates would be around maybe a million properly driverless cars by 2025. Right. Uh, and so bear in mind that, and that's annually um, and globally. Uh, bear in mind that we make about 80 million cars a year. Um, globally. So you're starting to see like a million is a lot of cars. Mm. Um, and a lot of those would end up in fleets. So they would be heavily utilized, not like a normal car. So we have a, you know, about 4,000 cars using GoFar in Australia at the moment. And we very, very rarely see a car that is used more than 5% of the time. Yes. Usually it's around three or 4% of the time and 95, 96, 97% of the time, the car's just sitting there kind of gently depreciating in your driveway. Um, and with autonomous cars, the expectation is that these will be used, you know, 20, 22 hours a day. Um, and so you won't need so many of them. So that million cars might go you know, a little bit further. Um, but yeah, even by sort of 2030, we're only, you know, they're only estimating about 30 million driverless cars in the world. Mm. So it's going to be quite a slow, and there's a billion cars out there right now, yes. 1.2 billion. So, you know, it, you're making a dent and it's it's getting significant, but, you know, that's that's a good, you know, so yeah. it's a decade it's away. Be, yeah, it's going to be a while. Uh, and um, why, why are you in Australia? What what attracted you to, to, for you to start this or co-found this in Australia? Um, so I, I was I was running a, a company in the UK, uh, working in data market research, um, and I, I moved to Australia about eight years ago. Um, and um, the thought process was very much: my wife told me we were moving, and I agreed. Um, and that, that was pretty much it. So I think if you if you marry an, an Aussie girl, then this this conversation happens at a certain point. Yeah, um, she didn't like and- the cold over from over in England. It wasn't loving it. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, so yeah. you climatized Jordan pretty much. getting his aircon going. You climatized exactly. pretty fast. Uh, sorry, say that again. You cli- you climatized pretty fast, did you? When you made, um, I, I think the first first six months was just like a holiday, just like an sort of exciting, you know, fantastic new country. Yes. Um, everything's new and interesting. Uh, then the second six months was like just weird. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> what am I doing in Australia? I, I, I never signed up for this. Yeah. And yeah, after that, all all good. I've I've got into it. I'm, I'm not even afraid of spiders anymore. So ki- kids are Aussie, Aussie. Kids? Yeah, kids are Aussie. Ah, oh, good yeah. stuff. Good stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Um, did you? Is there anything else you wanted to tell us, uh, Ian? Before before you left us, because I know uh, you got heaps of chats to uh, answer. By the look of it, <laughs> yeah, sorry, it's actually it's actually the wife. Um, so I mean, I, I think sort of some of the things that I, we're sort of finding sort of quite interesting is um, I, I get and you guys are sort of tech experts. Um, is 
technology tends to have a certain life cycle. Um, and so you know, I've just upgraded to my, uh, my Pixel 3. Mm. I had the Pixel 2 for, uh, usually I'd probably stick with a phone for a couple of years. But in, well, I've still got a Pixel 1, so you're doing better than me. Uh, there you go, yeah. Well, I would have had the Pixel 2 a bit longer, uh, Jordan, but unfortunately um, it didn't survive a night out. Um, and so that Gorilla Glass absolutely shattered and uh, I was shredding my fing- my fingerprints every time I was sort of uh, yeah. answering a phone. Um, so I, I went for the went for the sort of the Pixel 3 after about nine months, but usually we'll have a phone for a couple of years. Mm. Um, but what's interesting with cars is we're putting a lot of technology into cars now. And my, my 2005 Mazda 3, it's kind of before all that started. Yeah. And so it, it's, it's getting gently crapper every year. Yeah. Not, not that crap. That's, that's a nice Whereas way to put it. If if I if I see sort of I bought I've also got a 2010 Hyundai, um, and that's starting to have like the flats, you know, the the touch screen, but mm. like a 2010 touch screen in a car is yeah. really crappy now, <laughs> really crap, like embarrassing. Whereas my Mazda three, it was before all that, so yeah, it's got a radio and that's it. But so, that's okay. We're, but the, the Hyundai from 2010 is actually more dated than the five-year-old <laughs> Mazda. So um, what about the really old, older cars? Can They can't handle this connection either, can they? No. So, like, uh, I think, I mean, with, with OBD, we won't work. We, well, we'll work in American cars up to about 1996. Um, so about sort of 20, 22 years worth of American cars, which is pretty much everything. That's because the standard we work on came in America first, mm. and then it went to the European Union, Japan, and Australia was a little bit late to the party. Um, but my point was more just like when you get this brand spanking new technology and your fancy Mercedes, you know, this year, 2019, that technology is not going to look so good in 2021. Mm. No. Because it will age at the same rate as your mobile phone technology, um, but your mobile phone you'll be able to bin, yeah. whereas the car is the car's going to live for another ten or fifteen years. Um, but that technology is just not going to be quite so nice. Well, and the when, only when, were, have, when were the vehicles OBD? I mean, when did that? that I mean, every car would have to have OBD now, wouldn't it? I would think. Yeah, so it's it's mandated by law. Um, so in Australia, you, 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 some cars would have had it since 1996, maybe oh, the, US, the US imports, okay. but not many. No. Um, so it's maybe some of the early Fords. Um, uh, then some of the European cars, they, they couldn't be bothered to create a separate model for Australia. So from 2001, you might sort of find a, a BMW might be, might be OBD2 compatible. Mm. Um, but a lot of companies, they, they waited until the last minute when they were legally forced uh, to put the yeah. OBD2 protocol in uh, for Australia. So that would be Jan 2006 for, for petrol and Jan 2007 for diesel cars. Mm-hmm. Um, and so from then, and yeah, basically anything, anything other than pure EVs, pure electric cars won't work with the OBD2 protocol because they, they don't need to. Um, it was more around emissions tracking. That was you know, why it originally came in. And so the, ele- the pure electric cars were exempt. Um, but the hybrids, the diesels, the LPGs, those are all OBD2 compatible, and, and those will all work well with GoFar. Mm. And, and um, yeah, and you're finding that like it's it's useful for a lot of companies, like for fleets and stuff. They just they just throw them all in their their fleet cars, and away they go. They can they can they have a master a master uh, <laughs> app? You know, like they we, they can keep control of or view everyone's. Everyone um, so there's, there's a lot of good options if you if you want to buy um, a fleet management system for like for the, the whole fleet and the whole company. Um, GoFar doesn't do that at the moment. We've always focused on the driver, right. um, and so in, we always sort of you know the, the driver's driving has always been private for the driver. Mm. Uh, we are getting a bunch of kind of companies now, sort of like 10, 20, 30 cars who are saying, actually, we would really like yeah. this yeah, and good. to have a central console. So we will end up creating a dashboard, mm. um, but we're never going to create one of those kind of like tracking where everybody is and what they're doing applications. It, it will just be for protecting the car, slightly safer driving, yep. um, doing the tax and the expenses, um, 
and you know, will progressively sort of start adding. Just leave all, the, leave all the tracking to Google and Apple, I suppose. Right. <laughs> well, but, but, but I guess, yeah, they're already doing that on the mobile phone anyway. I mean, that's, that's one of the interesting conversations we have. People mm. sort of say, well, will this track me? And it's like, well, it's a Probably. telematics device. Yes, it, it will, but it won't do half as much as your mobile phone's already doing. Yeah, no, probably not. Yeah, no, yeah. it looks like a great little device. I'm very, uh, very happy that you came on this week to tell us all about it. It's, uh, it's very interesting. It's very and uh, very affordable for for everyone by the by the sounds of it. So it's uh, yeah, and I think it's a it's it's a little way that you can sort of get that connected car experience. I mean, it's mm. it's a lot cheaper than a Tesla. Yes, yeah, that's right. <laughs> a lot, a lot, a lot cheaper. Yes, um, and you and but although from what I heard on the what I read today, Tesla's little red car up in space is there, it's traveling pretty fast. <laughs> but I'll get back to that after after this. I wonder if it's got an OBD socket up there. Mm. Um, Teslas do have OBD2 sockets, but they, they don't work that well. <laughs> Not from the other side of Mars anyway. I, no, no, I think it's out of range. I don't, I don't think the blues will range. catch that. Yeah. No. Yeah. All right. Any final questions for Ian before he, before he goes and answers all these chats? Yeah. Well, look, I was just going to say on the, on the sort of one of the reasons why autonomous vehicles are probably not right around the, the corner. And this is sort of something I heard with, uh, this, there's a couple of good companies in Sydney kind of working on lasers and LIDAR and so on. Uh, and one of them was just saying, yeah, one of the issues that we have is, is bird poo. Mm. Um, and it's just these things you don't think of, but yeah, you'll have these LIDAR, these lasers on the, uh, you know, on the, the edges of your car to work out where you are compared to everybody else. Um, unfortunately, if a bird poops on your LIDAR plastic covering, um, one that's going to start sort of eating into the plastic covering and two, the, the laser doesn't work anymore. Oh. It's not that great in rain either. So if you're in Queensland with very, very heavy rain, it's scattering the, the, the laser signal. So we've got, we'll work through these issues of the engineering sort of uh, industry. Um, but that's why driverless cars are probably 98, 99% good at the moment. But to get a hundred percent, to get you won't get a hundred. But if you can get to get to ninety nine point nine nine percent good, mm. it's just really disproportionately difficult to get that extra one yeah. percent. Um, and so that's why it's going to take a little bit of time. And uh, look, before you go, are you Windows or Mac or Apple or Android? Oh, that's a, that's Ooh. a personal question, Glenn. I yeah. know. Oh, very it's very no personal <laughs> question. I, the I hard am, ones. I, I've been a bit of everything. So I yeah. I was Mac and iPhone for about five years. Um, I switched to um, – my Mac started playing up, and so I switched in high dudgeon to a Dell, um, and that lasted about nine months, and now I'm back on the Mac again, and it's so much better. And then I've switched um, from the iPhone to, to the Android handset. Uh, I would stay on the iPhone for now, if it was my choice, but we we just we have Android apps and we have iOS apps, so we yeah I, I use it for the, I'm, I'm on Android for the testing, right? But actually, I'm kind of liking the Pixel Three. Yeah, oh, I must good. admit I still love my Pixel One. I haven't upgraded it yet. Yeah, but I've heard there's good. a lot of little flaws with the Pixel Three software, but maybe they're ironing all that stuff out slowly. I don't know, but yeah, I'm, I'm fine. I'm, I'm I'm liking it. The Pixel Two is okay, but the I think Pixel Three is kind of nice. I think the Pixel is kind of a nice combination between Apple and like the iPhone and an Android phone, like whether it be Samsung or whatever. I think Pixel sits some, sit somewhere in the middle. It's kind of nice. Hmm. Yeah, so, some of the UX stuff is just kind of working quite nicely now. And, um, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty decent phone. Cool. Hmm. Good stuff. All right. Well, it's been great to talk to you, Ian. It's been very enlightening on what you do with the GoFar product. And, uh, yeah, I thank you very much. And, um, yeah, wish you well. Thanks very much, guys. Thanks, Joe. Yeah. Thanks, Jordan. Thanks, Glenn. Thank you. Catch well, you later. See you, Thanks, yeah. Ian. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. See you, right. mate. So how good was that? So we're all up to speed on the on the GoFar stuff now. So that's excellent. Uh, all right. Well, let's move on. We might as well get into some uh, stories yeah. and get the show back into some sort of normality and uh, and uh, whatever. So what, what, what did you think about that? Guys, Joe? What did you... I, I, reckon, I reckon it's a good idea. I mean, some, some people who have got, you know, cars that are from like 2010 onwards and they have that OBD port in their car, um, you'll probably find that a lot of people would like to know what's going on in their car. Yeah. Uh, but they don't actually have a, a touchscreen or anything like that that they can in their car. So I think by adding this device, 
and your smartphone with a little mm. like mounting bracket or something onto the dash, um, it would be pretty good. Mm. It is good. Look, the OBD um, works with a lot of different apps. There's, there's a lot of apps out there. I haven't haven't used go far and it's worth definitely worth a look but the obd plugs you can get and use with all sorts of situations i know because I, I like- and like you like like Ian was saying the mechanics hate it because all of a sudden you know the, the users know what's going on exactly what's wrong with their car when they walk in the dorm mm. and the mechanic tries to tell them something else it's like hang on a minute but this has just made it so much easier because like i remember like for, for a while you know you think oh you can buy these diagnostic plugs or whatever from yeah they're know, about 20 cheap. bucks you can get them anywhere yeah, just but- a plug but to put it all together, you go, well, what's this code? What's that code? How do I, what does it make sense of it all? Well, the app well, sort, this app sort of makes it look like it's great. I yeah. nearly got one because I just wanted a heads up display on my car. I just wanted to put my phone up there with yeah, my right. speedo and everything on it and a few other diagnostic things that you can't see in your dashboard. Like I wanted to see if my air conditioner was on or off because the air conditioner button's broken. Mm. And I never got around to it, but someone said to me, if you get an OBD plug and an app, you can kind of go oh it's on or off but you can't really change a lot of the settings you can only kind of just see the status of the things that are happening so mm. i don't know whether with um go far you can change things on the fly there's probably some you can some you can't they mm. probably don't want people oh. playing with their oh. computer chips too much <laughs> yeah oh, i'm pretty keen on one i'm gonna i'm gonna really look into one of those well, i actually yeah, have a look. one of those i got one of those obd um for the car um and i downloaded the app that was meant to run with that ABD. And um, look, the one that I got in particular wasn't all that good. It gave me some very basic and, and close to no information. Again, it could have been dependent on the kind of car that I had, but hmm. um, if well, you, maybe go fast what you need then. <laughs> you know, I guess well, this is what I was thinking. I was thinking if you're going to go with a go far, at least you know that with the go far, it says it's going to do this and it's going to do that and it's going to do this, this and it's going to do that. So, um, you, you you expect that to happen when you buy it, and you, it's I, I'm guessing they tested each GoPro uh, go far with um with each EB, EOBD um, sensor that you connect to your dash, so they would at least say okay, well we know that this app works with this particular car. Mm-hmm. Whereas the one I had, I, I tried two or three different apps, and in two or three different apps um, recommended apps were you know like this this thing was only like twenty five dollars, I think it was something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and, and it, it, it didn't work real good at all. I mean, sure, it, it detected it and it gave you all the different you know, sensors, readings and stuff, but it's just, I don't think, it didn't work very well. I don't good. think so much that it's the plug that's the problem. It's the app or the software that you use with it that makes all the... All mm. the exactly right, sense. and that's why I'm thinking if you go something with the GoFar, it's probably been designed to work with each other and they'll work a lot better than when the ones that you just go out and buy from, from eBay or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, let's uh, let's move on. I got a uh, a story about sort of maybe loosely related, but Myob, uh, the accounting software, ponders selling software at petrol stations. So, hey, the, yeah, so okay, the, is, hey, Myob, uh, Myob thinks that the petrol pump can play a big part in making uh, its software more attractive by sending information about transactions straight into your ledger. So that's where they're coming from. So sending transaction data from into MyOB is a new trick that they've concocted and come up with that's made it possible by partnering with prominent vendors like uh, Reese Plumbing and Caltex at the moment, to name a couple. Uh, so what's happening is, so you go to the, the uh, petrol station and you fill up. That will, MyOB, you can push it into your, well, the petrol station. It, everything's connected, so it ends up in your MyOB accounting software. So the service works by linking the da- the vendor's database system to the MyOBS backend. When you make a transaction, they can link it to your implementation and potentially arrange uh, for client codes to go with it. So if you're a trader, you go to Reese Plumbing, uh, you purchase a, uh, a sink, for example. So you go, yeah, sink, and it uh, was purchased for Joe. Well, then that goes away, goes into your MyOB account and into um, your customer's statement or whatever. But it's... it's uh, yeah, that's pretty good by the sounds of it. So it automates the whole the whole process, so you don't have to do it yourself. Yeah, pretty much. That's right. So the uh, what's it say here? So yeah, so it, the the idea is so it's to automate the billing, to automate the billing at the end at the tradies end. Say, um, Caltex wants more MyOB users to fill up at its service stations because offering the convenience of automated billing will help it sell more stuff. So they MyOB want current and potential end customers to have in-your-face reminders of the convenience its software offers when they shop. 
So yeah, don't so worry about the- Caltex. I reckon Seven Eleven's winning just with their coffees. Yeah, the free ones. Oh, the dollar coffees. That's getting heaps of people in to buy petrol, if you ask me. Oh, well, that's the, the, the 7-Eleven app. I think I've mentioned it before. You, you can lock your petrol in at a certain price. Yeah, I saw that the other day, and yeah. you can put money on your account. Mm. But apparently there's a few there's a few discrepancies, apparently. You've got to be very careful with it, from oh. what I read. Oh, okay, right. Like Things like where they're taking the money out that you put in and not the actual fuel amount or something, I don't know, something weird. Like it, It's never completely accurate. Okay, I have to... Keep an eye on it. I've never noticed anything, but uh, mm. yeah, I'll, I'll keep an eye on that because I, I use it. That's all I use because I can lock it in at today at a cheap price and fill up next week when the price has gone back up again. And um, yeah, it's good. But yeah, so um, I'm not sure if well, I explained that my one correctly, but the, the story's no, linked you, in the yeah, show notes. Sounded, no, it sounded good. But then what happens if you've got like a a, a motor pass or something like that? I suppose it, it, it's you know it's not going to work then, is it? Well, I guess like if once if the system takes off and if it looks uh, attractive enough, like then say my potentially par- uh, partner with the motor pass people, and then every time you go through the the thing, well, my will end up picking it up and sending it straight into your account. See, I just go into I go into server and I pay with motor pass, right. and then they just send me a bill at the end of each month, yeah. and then I just have to put one bill in each month rather than all of my fuel receipts. Yeah, well, this way, well, this way, I suppose you get a more detailed into your into your actual my Ob accounting system. So, yeah. Mm. Um, all right. Let's, uh, Joe, what, what's been going on? What have you got for us this week? Um, apparently, Google and Gmail is now blocking 100 million extra spam messages with the release of an um, AI. Right. Google's pretty good with spam. Yeah, they're yeah, good they at are, they're, pretty good. they're one of the best, um, and that's why I've stuck with uh, the Gmail. Apparently, they've got this um, artificial intelligence uh, logarithm going that detects spam messages, and they're stopping around about 100 million extra spam messages every day because of wow. it. O- only in their email accounts, though, the Gmail accounts. Correct. Only in the Gmail, yep. But not, in your own, not in your own account, like not in your own IMAP that's in your phone or something. No, no just no, Gmail. No, no, this is, and I'm sure it'll be um, also in their business suite as well, their yeah. G Suite. Because um, they're doing it with telephones too, aren't they? Stopping spam calls with the same, probably the same algorithm. I don't know about that at the moment. This is just to do the do the emails. Apparently, yeah. Google has recruited a um, a house machine learning framework from a company called uh, TensorFlow. Oh. Um, yeah, and they did that a few years ago, and it's been put in place to um, add extra, you know filters and, and uh, logarithms to, um, to detect uh, spam mail. Mm. And uh, since they've been using it, they reckon they've you know, detected almost 100 million, like 100 million spam yeah. every day. Like, it wouldn't be hard to do when you think that many, there's that many Gmail users. Yeah, 100 I know. 100 million emails, it's not much. Yeah, yeah well, apparently what, what they do is that uh, the, they look for things that are most obvious, um, like um, patterns that might not suggest that it's an email that's got spam on it. So things like um, they balance the the number of metrics from formatting of the type of email, yeah, to the actual email. So you're using AI intelligence to do it. Yeah, um, and even up to the time and the date that the email is sent, and they use things like that to detect whether a message could be spam because you, you'll notice that. A lot of spam messages sent by spam companies or whatever they're called, and they all go out at the same time. So they pick up some sort of logarithm algorithm to, to be able to detect that sort of thing. Google's always been pretty good at blocking spam, though, hasn't it, Glenn? I reckon it's um, it's always pretty quiet the inbox on, on Google. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yes, Google is is great. Like um, as long as I can remember, they've been pretty good. Yeah, I think a lot. Of, the other way that a lot of these things block the spam is is, is by like user user um, activity or interactivity. Like, so you know, if you get something that comes through the inbox, say on your Gmail inbox, and it is spam, and it might have slipped through the filter, well, you just click, you know, this is spam, and then it'll go away, and it then teaches that, it. Yeah, and then I suppose if a lot of people do it, well, then it gets to know. Like, there, it's interesting because I had a uh, customer that ring up ring me up through the week saying, "Oh, their Mailchimp." Uh, things their 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 campaign that was going to people junk boxes and uh, yeah, but Mailchimp sort of guarantees it doesn't, doesn't it? 
I or um, yes, but unless <laughs> this is right, but be, what happens is because these guys <laughs> were probably actually they were sending like legitimate emails, but to many people they were unsolicited. And so they were kind of spam. And so people that were getting them were just going, well, what's this rubbish spam? What's this rubbish spam? And there's, yeah. There was quite a few of them that they, they're doing a marketing campaign, so uh, unsolicited. And so therefore, MailChimp has gone, well, okay, we've been getting a few uh, people saying that this is spam. So we've, we've classified it as a spam campaign. And so it was being going to people's spam boxes. I always so, wonder what would happen with MailChimp because how can they guarantee that it's that they won't get caught as spam when that's what people that's exactly what people are doing. Well, you, well no, not really because you're supposed to, if you're sending out a, a campaign you're supposed to have the permission. So you know when you people sign up for a newsletter or whatever. So yeah. it's just well, look, I, yeah, I can sort of understand. I mean, how many mails do you get from advertisers and you go, oh, "I don't want this. This is spam according as, as far as I'm concerned." and report it as spam. So therefore it doesn't matter whether uh, Mailchimp actually says it's not spam. The actual end user might say, you know what, I think it's a spam because I never asked for it and it could have right. been on some sort of mailing list. It's like eBay. How many bloody junk emails do you want to get from eBay these days? Mm. Oh, it's phenomenal the amount of crap I get from eBay. Yeah, I love so eBay, people, but don't get me wrong. Yeah, so people would actually start um, saying that that's spam and so then the logarithm picks it up and says, okay, well, that's spam. Mm. It doesn't matter if it's coming from MailChimp or anywhere. Now, some of the algorithms that you speak of, they, they do they come in and, uh, you know, certain words and whatnot. There's a good site on the internet. Uh, like if you do send newsletters out, say they might all, and just from your domain, just from your normal email account, and, you know, you're thinking, oh, some of these are getting sent as spam. Why is this? They're not getting through. My users wouldn't be uh, make, set, saying they're spam because they're all uh, solicited email. So what's going on? There's a thing called the spamanalyze.com. And there it is. There you can punch in your little your um, your text in here, in that little box there, and you go analyze, and it'll tell you, in its opinion, whether it's a spammy content or not. Uh, so it's not a bad little little test if you're trying to work out why your things are going to junk. So um, spam analyze s p a m a n a l y s e dot com. So that's a good one. I've used it. I think people say, why are my emails going to spam? I punch it in, said, oh, so you're talking about, uh, I don't know. Viagra, <laughs> easy, easy one for Google to ping, Viagra ones. But uh, yeah, so um, yeah, good stuff, Joe. Good, good work. Um, is that it for that one? For that one, yeah. Yeah, all right. Now, wherever I've only got a couple this week because I knew we were going to have uh, Ian on. But uh, look, this this other one that I came up with was, you know, that is this like third world problems? But anyway, there's uh, disability themed emojis have been approved for use. Now, a couple of things that I went, hmm, about is I didn't know emojis have to be approved to like buy some consortium to be used, but apparently they do. So the new characters include hearing aids, wheelchairs, prosthetic limbs, white probing canes, and guide dogs. So um, I don't... It's like you can see that they're going to be used, you know, in, um, in uh, a nice way. Well, that's yeah. what I was thinking. Like, why... Like that, you know, yeah, that, yeah, I know what you mean. Like people think, are gonna, people aren't gonna use them for what they're for. No, no, I, I, I can't see. Like, say, if you're a man, what, where would you use the man with the cane? You know, or a woman with the cane emoji. Um, like, even if you were, um, people will make fun of it. Like they say, you know, they'll say, oh, no, I don't want to say because mm. I don't know anyone, but people will make fun of it. Yeah, but that that'll somehow happen with, they'll use them to make fun in their conversation. But that'll happen with anything. But like I suppose, yeah. like they're there if you want to use them, and and however you use them, it's up to you, I guess. But mm. apparently, like, apparently, it all came about following a complaint to Apple that there were few existing emojis spoke to the experience of those with disabilities. Like, um, so I guess they must the people that well, look, you know, it, it'd be good for them. But they I must think, want to use it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, but it will be taken advantage of by people who don't have disabilities, and it's to be expected. Now, the other crazy one, and uh, this is where it starts getting a little bit crazy. Uh, remember, they took away the gun. Can't have a gun. But you can have a drop of blood, which is meant to offer women a new way to talk about menstruation. And so they've, if so, once, the, once it's, uh, this has apparently been approved, so now you can... You, you can <laughs> Are you kidding me? You really? You can have the blood emoji. Uh, in addition... Well, you know what? Every time I have, I have a pie with sauce for lunch, I'm going to post that. I'm enjoying my <laughs> pie with sauce, and I'm going to post that. So uh, there was apparently this is this is serious stuff. There was a uh, online vote in 2017 
uh, for what a period-themed emoji should look like. Oh, very serious and well thought out. The most popular choice was a pair of pants marked by blood. But when that was rejected by the Unicode Consortium, the charity pushed for a blood drop instead. So, okay. Why do people want to explain that sort of thing with an emoji? I don't know. Yeah, I, mean, I, don't, yeah, I don't know. People but, get so offended these days over so many different things. I, I, it just makes me wonder how these things kind of get in Mm. And and other things don't get in, or vice versa. It's like it's, it's just another way to. It's uh, just it's just silly, way to isn't it? Grab data off you as well. I, I, have, I, mean, I remember reading this story somewhere where they said that stuck within the emoji, there's some sort of code or something that they can exploit to be able to. You know, most most women I know, if they were going through that cycle, they wouldn't even bother getting on Facebook and posting about it. They're not going to tell everyone about it. Why do they need it? <laughs> Why do they need an emoji icon to I don't know. tell everybody how emotional they are? Oh, I'm so emotional because I've got my hmm. cup of blood emoji. Yeah, there was a, some meme I saw a little while oh. ago. It was, uh, you know, they said well, 2,000 years ago, you know, Egyptians used hieroglyphics. This is how far we've progressed. We're now back using the, the pictures to talk with. Oh, but, it's just silly, isn't but, it? Yeah, I, I, I thought, you know, the, the just the, the yellow hand, the yellow fingers, the yellow thing was... Uh, just that's how the, uh, you know, that's how the smileys and things were. I think emojis are went. great, you know, like your thumbs up and smiley faces. Mm. And, but, I think but then, you know, then the, then the, they, they had to have the black ones and then they, you know, and all this sort of stuff. I think. Oh, you don't want to offend anybody. No, but who's got yellow skin to start with? Where's the white? Oh, they have white ones, I think, too now. I think I've seen the white ones. So I just use the yellow ones because it's just easy. It's the first one that comes up. Um, yeah. So I don't even use them. I still write LOL and, and a, what's the column with the back with the. With the bracket and yeah, sort of, I still use all those things. Yeah, I do sometimes. Depends. I'm still as bad as I'm still as bad as you know how in the old days when we had we had phones with you know ABC on one button, DEF on the next, and that sort of thing. And so you'd type everything shorthand, like mm. see you later would be C and U, and then you'd have to write out later or whatever. Yeah, because I, I'm still doing things like that. Isn't it terrible? Yeah. You think in this day and age with predictive text and and you know the help of AI writing our text messages for us that I still write with. But I think those. emojis do, the the advantage I see with emojis is like, how many conversations have you had, say over text or in an email or whatever, where the person on the, the receiving person has taken what you've said entirely the wrong way? You know, like you might have been sarcastic or something in your... Well, that's what the emojis for, isn't That's it? right. If you put a little smiley face at the end, they go, ah, ha, ha, ha. Kind of makes you realise that the text is not so emotionless. Yeah, and that's, that's right. That's what it's That's what it's for. Mm. Um, Joe, tell us. So about... now we've got now we've got uh, disabled emojis. Yes, yes. So that's something to uh, look forward to. Another. There's too many of them now. Anyway, isn't there? Like, you know, like how do you get? You, to... yeah, you got to scroll through your emojis. Yeah, I need a I need a search for for emoji a search yeah. bar. Uh, Joe, you you got to tell us about some Bose sunglasses or something. Yeah, this is this was something that I saw interesting. This well, they got like speakers in them or something. That's right. Yeah, oh, one hundred ninety nine dollars. You can buy some Bose uh, frames, and uh, they're actually audio sunglasses. Um, the Bose frames is a pair of sunglasses that houses some speakers in its frame. Wow! It's also got a microphone near near the temple, and uh, it allows users to play music and take calls as well. The users are also able to interact with Siri and Google Assistant using these glasses. And after you pair the frames to the phone, um, however, interactions are limited to um, asking to play music or handle music playback only at the It'd moment. It'd be nice if it had heads-up display in there as well, but it won't, will it? No, not these particular ones. Uh, when, the, when the sunglasses are paired with a smartphone, um, it, also, it, acts, it also acts uh, as a device for a GPS location. It also acts on its own uh, nine-axis nine axis, uh, motion sensor to tell what direction the head is, uh, is pointing in. And, and the, there's a new feature that Bose is introducing, and they call it the um, AR, which is augmented reality. Um, that will be available for users on the new Bose app, which connects um, by your, your phone mm. uh, on, on a software update coming soon. So what is the, the AR they're talking about? Well, it's it's um, unlike your normal argument of reality uh, products, Bose doesn't actually 
uh, change what you see, but it knows what you're looking at. Right. Yeah, it does that without any integrated lenses or, or with the phone's camera. Uh, it, 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 and rather what it does is it's um, super, rather than superposing visual objects in the real world, Bo says that the, um, the AR adds as an audible layer of information um, and gives you a different type of experiences, uh, making it a little bit uh, easier for you every day. <laughs> How cool is that? There's so much in this space, isn't there? Like augmented reality, there's so much in that space. The, the assistance, the digital assistance, there's so much there. Uh, although I, I read with the, those speakers that Apple seems to be struggling a bit with their HomePod. Um, I think they sort of missed the, the, missed the market <coughs> there a bit. Did they but, miss the boat? Google beat them to it, I think. Yeah, Alexa. And Alexa as well. Mm. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, like, uh, and I think like the uh, the complaint that I've, I've heard with the people that are using the Apple in the Apple universe is that it's, uh, it's just, like everything else, it's just incompatible with a lot of stuff. You know, you can't, you can't just say use it with Spotify. You got to use it with the Apple Music. You know, you're restricted to the Apple ecosystem. But anyway, that's another story. But you, but you know, just a quick one on that though, is even having Ian on earlier before when he said he went from Apple to Android and then back to Apple again. It's amazing how many people do keep going back to Apple for that simplicity. That yeah, I don't know what it is. Maybe people are just kind of no, they, look, kind of just they're just it's second nature to them now. I don't know, but. Look, I look. I miss the the uh, seamlessness of what you do on the phone with, from Apple. Like my phone, like you know, like I've got, I've had to install apps to do this, to do that, to do the other, to make it work like iOS. Like say, uh, the little, you know, maybe you, get, you should stop trying to make it work like iOS. Well, just simple things. I mean, like you know, like you get the little numbers say on your SMS icon, say how many SMSs you've missed or that you haven't read yet. Right, that's not native to Google, so you've got to get an app to do that. And now I find that something's gone wrong with the app, or the app, the phone's updated, and that app hasn't been updated, so now it's not working properly. And just just that sort of stuff. But then when you look at Android, there'll be apps exactly the same that are on the Apple Store, for example, that don't um, that don't have the same features in, as the and like the Android, it's the exact same app. Mm. Android will have more more features than Apple. Look, I've, I've played because Apple restricts the features. True. Yes, yes. That, well, that's right. You can change more stuff. Like, like I remember in the old days, I had it as an example. I may have changed now, but I had the old OwnCloud app many, many years ago. I don't use OwnCloud anymore, but I remember looking at it on Apple, mm. and Apple didn't have the auto photo upload, but Android did. Yeah. I think what I've got to like do... Just one little thing. What I've got to want to do with my phone, my Xiaomi, is I think I want to... Just reset it. But now that I've had a play with it for quite a few months, I just want to reset it and then just go vanilla and then just really be particular with what I put on it. Ah, yeah. More enough. Yeah. Uh, all right. Now, look, I've got, got an email through the week. You might remember Stuart. He was uh, on the show for a little while, back a couple of years, I guess, by now. Uh, so he was listening last week when I had my issue about the, you know, what's uh, cross platform SMS messenger app that i could yeah, use I, yeah I, th- I saw that and someone posted in jordan wanted to know about this app and i'm like it wasn't me yeah it was it was you me. yeah it was you <laughs> so uh i think so Stuart has suggested slack now i've used slack on the desktop uh, i don't you not currently using it but isn't, hang on slack isn't that that it's a messaging app like Skype, I guess, with rooms. So you set up different rooms, different chat rooms and so what was what was the microsoft I must. I must oh, have a teams. Must, teams. So, what was the one that everyone uses that's similar to that? Uh, yeah, there was Slack. Well, Skype is it doesn't Slack? have rooms. Um, is it Slack? No, there is. Dis, is there dis, dis, not discuss something else? Uh, that started with a it D. It was Teams, and everyone everyone's like, "Oh, we're going to use Teams," but isn't it? But everybody at the moment currently uses blah blah blah, and that's bigger than Teams. But they want everyone to use Teams. Teams doesn't work properly. I tried to use Teams when I went through I my... Thought it was, I thought it was Slack. It's like a, a way to congregate. It is. But, but the problem with the Teams was, Slack. was that, say, if, if, I'm, if I say I, uh, I run company A, but I also run company B, I can't have company A and B on the, the same team program. It's just, you can't do You've it. You've got to have a separate team for each company. 
No, you can't do it. It's just going to have them separated. Yes, it's just you got teams on your machine. That's just you for one company. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how you got to sign out if you want to see what people are saying about your other company. You got to sign out and sign in again as the other company. Oh, you can't have them listed and just pick which one you want to. Yeah. No, there is an update, and I haven't bothered to go back, so they might have changed. So Slack, I think Slack was the one that everyone talked about that was the equivalent to Teams. Um, or Teams was the equivalent of Slack. What was the first big one to come out before Slack? Uh, yeah. Before Teams. Look, there's look. I don't. Uh, is, the main one. Everyone was. I think it was Slack. So anyway, continuing on. I don't want to get stuck in a in a debate over something we don't have an answer to. No, I'm just I'm just googling now. I'm just googling uh, the 25 best Slack alternatives. I'm sure it'll come. The one that I had signed up for. Oh, there's one. Fleep. Never heard of it. F double F L double E P. Rocket Chat. Jesus, how many are there? Rocket Chat matter most. There's heaps of them. Ryver, R Y V E R. Uh, these are all you know. Some are free, some are paid for. C A Flow Doc, uh, Flock. Uh, you got Twist. I haven't seen the one that I think we're talking about. Microsoft Teams. Uh, the Skype for Business. The Glip, G L I P. It is Slack because I just wrote into. I just wrote into Google Microsoft Teams yeah. versus, and it came up with Slack. Yeah, Missive. No, that doesn't look too bad. It looks like Outlook. Slack a bit. is one I was thinking of. Differences between Slack and Microsoft Teams. I'm going to Slack go back to this. Have their similarities and differences. Despite their similarities, there are a lot more differences between Slack and Teams, including app integration, content sharing, and development. Overall, both are communication tools. The difference with the features are minor details. I haven't seen the one that I was thinking of. I'm up to number twenty. High side, high box. This guy was this guy was saying you should use Slack as a cross platform messaging app. Is that what you're saying? Yes. So get back to yeah, get back to Stuart's email. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I think the app you need is Slack. Um, I was in exactly the same situation a couple of years ago and found Slack to be a great solution. So what I wanted was say so I've got an Android. My son's got an iPad. No SIM. No phone number. How do we? SMS each other or how do we communicate where it comes up and dings on his machine instead of just silently sitting there till he looks at it. Um, you can direct message Slack users and get notifications like an SMS and also easily send files back and forth. It's cross-platform including PC, handy, uh, so no need for a SIM card. You can also set up private chat rooms for your family so that all members that can chat amongst themselves, uh, that is set up a private room for upcoming holiday or blah, 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 blah. So, um, yeah, I'm and gonna, how much is Slack? I wonder. Well, Slack is free unless you want to go pro. So I think you can just. Like, oh, well, I've I've downloaded it before and I've used it, but I've never sort of never took. But the Teams is free. Yeah. So this is pro- Microsoft Teams is free. I think. Yeah, but it doesn't work. Here we go. There's there's some free versions for small teams wanting to try out Slack for an unlimited period of time. Uh, so you get searchable messages, shared, don't do shared channels, single channel guests. There's a couple of things that, yeah, that's restricted, but it's five gig total of storage. But it, it's going to be enough just to... Uh, I've never used Teams at all, so I ha- wouldn't even know where to start with either of them. Yeah, well, I'm not a fan. But anyway, so that's the email. So let's go and, back. So with Teams, does your kid have to create an account with Microsoft to be able to access Teams? Or can you just add the... The, the users in as you please and create user accounts for them. Yeah, but you'd have. But I think it's mainly for businesses. So I think so. Then so okay. So you set your team up around, say, your email address. Yes, and you invite someone, your family, into it. But the problem is then, or well, if you want to use Teams for your work, you've got to sign out and sign back in as something else. So you're mm-hmm. not then you're not going to get notifications from the family side of messages because you've signed out. Because you've had to sign in for something to, to do. I understand that. That's yeah. pretty annoying. But yeah. even so, with Slack and Teams and things like that, do 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 say you want to have multiple users in a, in a Slack chat room, or whatever? Do they all have to go and register accounts? Those users, or can you create users accounts yourself within your own account, like sub sub users that can? Oh, they'd have to have a Slack account. And you just invite them into the room. I'd say. Yeah, I'd yeah. say. But uh, yeah, look, it's not too bad to use from what I remember. But yeah, thanks, Stuart. I'll uh, I'll, I'll revisit Slack, and uh, if, if you're using, I think it, ultimately sure it too, when it comes to using you, you know, having something for your kids to chat with you on, and this is the biggest, the biggest thing I've that, that's concerned me since day one with my kids with being 
cross-platform Android and Apple, having, you know, my wife on Apple and me on Android and the daughter on Apple and my son on, on Android. The biggest thing is when they were younger, not so much now as much, they're a little bit more responsible, but when they were younger, it's the security side of it. It's like, mm. you know, if you, if you go and install Skype, for example, and then they start getting chats from people they don't know, you know, like. But you can turn that off. You can turn it off. And the same with, you know, other things like not probably not so much with Viber and that because Viber runs on a, they have to have a phone number. So I suppose only the people who have your phone number are going to know to call you. But my same thing with Slacks and Teams would be is how secure are those chat rooms? You know, mm. look, this you is. Know, are we, we going to have strangers coming in? And because when they're kids, no. you know, you really want to limit that use. I think, I think, well, as far as you would imagine, that'd be pretty safe. You, you can just say limit the contact uh, to people in your contact list. I, I would imagine with Skype. But the one I was thinking of was was the Discord. Here it is. Here I found it. Oh, Discord. You've talked about this before because we we talked about using that to have call ins. Yeah. Yeah. So um. Yeah. So They're like chat rooms. So that's that one. But uh, look, let, we better move on because we've got to get uh, Joe's got a couple more to do before we go. Uh, Joe, take it away with your next one. Okay, well, we know that the iPhone, um, many, uh, I'll start again. Many popular iPhone apps are secretly recording your screen without you ask, without you knowing about it. Mm, I just have a lot of hard drive space. Good old yeah, Apple. I know. Is that because <laughs> the developers are or Apple is? <laughs> well, apparently developers are. Uh, what's going it makes on? you wonder how the developers get away with it, with Apple. It's um, some major companies like Air Canada, Oliesta, Expedia are recording every tap and every swipe you make on your iPhone app. In most cases, you won't even realize they're doing it and they don't need uh, to ask your permission for it as well. Oh, so that's, that? yeah, I was going to say that's, um, yeah, I thought, I thought we were leading to something else. I thought when it, when the headline was many popular iPhone apps see it record your screen, I thought it was like, you know, you on your banking screen and it's recording your, details actually recording the actual visual screen but it's just taps within apps oh no it's actually recording your screen as well i'll let you oh. know i just go on yeah oh yeah absolutely well, is uh, that why westpac got rid of the tapping password thing uh when you're using your smartphone one can assume that most apps are collecting data from you um even you know some are even monitorizing the data without you knowing about it so you can assume that that's normally the case uh, when you're using something but um TechCrunch has uh, found several popular iPhone apps from hotelers, travel sites, airlines, um, phone carriers, banks, financial institutions that don't ask or make it clear, if at all, that they know exactly what they're taking from the app. Mm. So um, what makes it even worse is that these apps are meant to mask certain fields but inadvertently expose sensitive data. When, mm. I haven't used Apple in so long, and you might be able to answer this, Glenn, but when you install an Apple app, because you're probably more frequent to Apple than I am, does it pop up with a permissions thing saying what this, what you're going to allow this app to, what information this app's going to be allowed to use on your device like, like Android no. does? No, not as far as I know. I think you've just got to make yourself aware <laughs> uh, from the description or from the App Store when you're reading about it before you install it, I think once you install it, uh, away she goes, as far as I know. Because with that, with, with Android, it pops up and says, doesn't yes. it? Yes. This I, is, yeah. you, you need to allow permissions for Android to use this data, this data, this data, and access yeah. your your access your uh, photo albums and blah, blah, blah. Well, Apple probably is, <laughs> is backing their vetting process, I'd say, and making mm. sure that, you know, because they vet every app. Uh, I think they run... They run programs across code of all the apps to see, you know, if there's any nasty stuff going to happen as an end result and all that sort of stuff. Well, that's what I just said before. It'd be surprising that I think more that the developers wouldn't be able to read the screens that Apple would, not not the developers, because Apple probably wouldn't let the developers get away with it, but they might be able to. Yeah, yeah. So um, it's no, it's no good, Joe. No, no good at all. Either way, there's, there's nothing's private these days. No, let me just tell you how. Um, how they say they reckon they do this. Um, apps like uh, Abercrombie and Fitch 
Hotels.com, Singapore Airlines, they use what's called Glass Box. Now, for those who don't know, Glass Box is a, a customer experience analytic firm. Um, it's one of many. And what that does is it creates data uh, which allows developers to embed session replay technology into their apps. These sessions replay replays let app developers record the screen and then play them back to see how its users interact with the app to figure out if something didn't work or if it's not working properly or if there's some sort of an error. Yeah, so every tap, every push button, every keyboard entry is recorded, effectively screenshotted, um, and then sent back to the apps developer. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a bit nasty. It sure is. Um, a, a bloke calls himself the app analyst. Um, he's a mobile expert who writes about these sort of anal uh, analytics for popular apps uh, on his blog. Recently found Air Canada uh, iPhone app wasn't properly masking the session uh, and replays when they were bent, when when they were sent, exposing passport numbers, credit card data, and each replay session. Yeah, this, right. Yeah, this gives Air Canada employees and anyone else who's capable of accessing the screenshot database uh, to see unencrypted credit card and password information. Well, that's what they told um, TechCrunch anyway. Mm. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's a bit of a worry, I guess. You know, like if, if yeah, I, I think you at this day and age, you've got to accept that a certain amount of stuff goes across the internet, but... I think recording everything you do, is that getting a bit much? Does that get a bit crazy? Yeah, look, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess that they, I get that they want to try and, you know, work out whether, you know, something is wrong. But, you know. Well, I guess, um, look. The, I just... link that, the, link, the link you got there, right, I, I sent in the, in the show notes, actually shows um, it's been, you know, scratched out, but it shows you different um, screenshots of what information that they see. Hmm. I mean, you know, could you imagine using Hotel.com app and then finding out that all the credit cards that you use for booking rooms and what have you have been recorded in a database? Mm. I mean, you know, to finish off, it says that these types of database industries are unlikely to go away anytime soon. Uh, big companies rely on this kind of session replay um, to understand why things break. Mm. And, you know, in the and they use for you know, which could cost high, a lot of money to fix. And but the fact that the app developers don't publicise or tell anyone about it, it just shows you the hell, um, you know. Well, that's how they're flogging it on the on the the glass box uh, website. Is uh, whether or not it, that this is off their website. Whether you're an IT technician or a CTO is tending to focus on data rather than people behind the numbers. Glassbox gives you a deeper understanding of your customers by helping identify the reasons why they do or don't interact with your platform in the way you intended. So I guess like in that respect, that's an innocent type of reason why you would do it. You know, So like you say, well, if people, they, 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 click, click, they click on a product, they click on the checkout, and then they, they click away. Why are they doing that? Um, or, you know, they've clicked on this button three times. So is there a problem with, with this button not working or, or something like that? But yeah, look, I, I get that. But the fact that is that, you know, you think your data's safe. You think mm. that, you know, no one can see it. Well, that's know, why, like, I don't... Yeah, look, I've got a debit card that I use. That's the only thing I'll use on the internet. Like a credit card I won't put on. Um, I've, got a, I've got one of those postcards. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think it's... Uh, that's, yeah, it's the safest way to be. You don't, don't use your main cards. No, no, I, 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 I think that's right. Uh, although I, ha I guess I do have the credit card hooked up to the PayPal uh, and so forth, but, uh, but everything like that's you can, you can fight that. You can, you know, you can dispute problems with with PayPal and they're on your side. Mm. Yeah, but I'm, I'm, yeah, it's saying like, but with the debit card, you know, if you go onto some site to buy a subscription to, um, I don't know, um, Horn Weekly. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you know, you want to... Um, yeah, exactly. You know. Did you give them a plug? Horn Weekly. I'm probably... I'm sure it probably exists. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just having a stab. All right. Let's let's uh, let's get on to the last one, Joe. Okay. The last one I have for the night is... Not many people might know, but Optus has been fined $10 million for misleading customers. Wowzers. 
Yeah, apparently the ACCC has just announced that the federal court has ordered Optus to pay $10 million for misleading customers. Proceedings against Optus began on October uh, 2018, with order being handed down today. Wow. Yeah, so what was the breach? The, they were uh, in the breach of corporate regulations. Some Optus customers unknowingly bought digital content such as ringtones and games through their third party billing services. These purchases occurred when the customers were subscribed to what's called an Optus Direct Carrier Billing System. Mm. Um, the Turco has admitted that it did not adequately inform its customers that this service was set to default on their accounts. So uh, from what I understand from that was that people who were subscribed to this Optus Direct Carrier Billing Service, if they actually bought um, these, um, these ringtones, you know, the ones I'm talking about, where you buy these ringtones and they automatically bill you again the next yeah. week. Or oh, month. yes. Yep. Those, those sort of things. Yep. Subscriptions. Yeah, those sort of subscription mm. type things. Yep. Uh, so if anyone was on that particular system, they were automatically re, re, rebuilt every every month or every time that the carrier... Or the terrible. Store. It only has to be a dollar or something. People don't even notice it. But this yeah. is right. Yeah, apparently Optus... Um, gets subscriptions uh, and they get commissions from them. Um, it was, uh, whether it was intentional or unintentional, purchase actually occurred. So Optus admitted that and it was aware that the customers were being billed for these services, sometimes without even their knowledge. So That's and, the scary part. Yeah. And it's gone back up until around about eight, April 2014. And I don't know about you, but I do remember... Um, getting stuck for a couple of these sometimes and, and I didn't even buy anything, you know. Mm. Well, I think that's and, what they're uh, saying. That's why, it's hard to that's get them why PayPal is so good because PayPal um, notifies you. Yes. Yeah, so when you when you create a subscription or whatever, they let you know. And you, well, you've got control over it as well. You can go into PayPal and stop it. Yeah, and, exactly. And, and whatever. But, yeah, look, this has been going on for a little while, I think, hasn't it, all these type of things, like the unscrupulous third parties. And, yeah, they, they just... Uh, you know, they say they somehow they'll they'll send you an SMS and say, "Oh, would you like this ringtone or something?" It's two dollars, and you go, "Oh, yeah, sounds all right, okay, might buy that." But then what doesn't what they don't tell you is that you, you go in for a subscription for ten bucks a month. I think yeah, I've seen or, some crazy ones like ten bucks a week, or it's two dollars a month and you don't realise it. It's like it's two dollars, you don't realise mm. it's a subscription. Like how many? Like how do these? Uh, uh, you know, when you watch an I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. You vote. With the SMSs? I don't know. I've never watched it. Well, you know when you vote with SMS, like you know, who you want to kick out or who you want to stay in, or <laughs> yeah, know, yeah. You know, I'm just, same. I'm just, I'm just having having a lend of you. Yeah. So I, don't, I can't stand reality TV anymore. I'm over it. Yeah, I'm getting that way. But uh, but how do they like most people are on these plans, free MS plans? You know, like on whatever unlimited SMSs, blah blah blah. How do they get their fifty cents for that SMS to boot someone off the show? Is that if you're on through, a, the, through the, tel, te, the telco, whoever it may be, yeah. So you have to be, you can't be on a prepaid plan. You have to be on a postpaid plan, so they can bill the bill, bill your tele. That must be how that works. But it just comes out of your prepaid. If you, you know, if you've got thirty bucks on your prepay and you make a fifty cent phone call, it's fifty cents. If you make a dollar phone call, it's a dollar. Yeah, but you get. I've got prepaid. I get unlimited calls, unlimited SMSs. Yeah, but, but I, don't, I don't think they include those. I don't think they include those calls. You probably can't make those calls right. on. Yeah, phone. probably not. So, so you're only on a on a postpaid account. You probably dial it up and says this call cannot be made from this device. Or probably. Mm. That's probably why people that I want kicked off never get kicked off. My votes aren't counted. Angry. No, <laughs> your votes probably aren't counted either way. It's all, it's all, you know, hocus pocus. Yeah, it's all hocus pocus. Yeah. It's whoever's got the, you know, it's, it's whoever can get the ratings up the most wins yeah. the show. Yeah, probably. Yeah, so apparently Optus failed to take appropriate action when it comes to these people's complaints. Right. Uh, and it chose to instead to continue charging customers. You know, there was like, they were saying that, you know, they keep calling up and they can't get off. Even if you, you remember you had to type uh, yes or, or no or, or something. Yeah. What was that code word that you had to type in as a back as a message? Yeah, yeah. For, for, for Optus, stop. always yes. Yeah, I think it was stop. stop. Yeah, stop. you had to reply. Oh, stop. stop. Yeah, even even by doing that, it, it wouldn't it wouldn't stop the services from 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 going. I still keep billing. It's you. funny, isn't it? They activate it, and you've got a message stop to to stop it. 
not message activate to activate it. Yeah. Oh. It's always the other way around, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, but anyway, so because of all that, that's that's why they got fined the $10 million. Mm. And apparently Telstra was fined the same amount in April last year. The same. That's Wouldn't, right, yeah. wouldn't surprise time. me. Yeah. Mm. All right, lovely. They're well, all the same. Aussie Tech Head still hasn't been fined for anything, though, because they're good blokes. We don't do nothing wrong around here. We no, are we're good. Richie We've been Rich. in trouble off YouTube a couple of times, but that's kind of as far as it goes. Ah, oh, YouTube, you spube. That's nothing. Oh, you'll get in trouble. Don't say that. They'll <laughs> Google, Google, yank. You'll get another. You'll get another warning email like you did when you had Will on the uh, Will and Jace on the program <laughs> one night. And you got a, a warning email the next day from YouTube. Yeah, saying that it was uh, obscenity or something. <laughs> <laughs> And I go, that's right, because they did the show. And then I get this YouTube email the next day. I'm thinking, what the hell have these guys been up to? <laughs> it wasn't just, you That's know, right. You weren't you were there, actually. That's right. Yeah, it, was, uh... it wasn't like, uh, you know, oh, we've we've uh, detected the song in the background, you know, blah, 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 take it down. It was like, you've been flagged for, like, obscenity or something. <laughs> it was something <laughs> really wild. I'm thinking, what have they done, these boys? Aussie tech porn or something. But, uh, but yeah, cool. So, look, let's uh, finish off there. We've gone a bit over time. We are obviously because we had Ian in this week, so that was great. He was interesting to talk to. I, I liked talking to him. And that product, it's even better when the product is something that you, you're I liked. I, I like the look of it. I like what it does. Uh, you know, oh, look, you know, if there's, if there's anybody else out there that's got an interesting company or product that they'd like to talk about, they should send you an email, Glenn, shouldn't they? They should. They should. And uh, you can send it to glenn at aussietechheads.com.au. And, um, yeah, we'll go from there. We'll uh, work it out. But, like, try and uh, sometimes I get the emails and they're, I don't know, you know, I don't really like emails that come to me and they're just high, you know, like put Glenn in there or something, you know. Show me that you listen to the show or show me why you want to come on the what show. What do you mean they're just very short and abrupt, like? Uh, like uh, at, sometimes it's just like uh, emails from promotion agencies just hi we've got a we've got this guy that does this 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 and this love to come on your show you know and that's it yeah how just, many how many emails have that been sent to spam you know like just yeah. say you know, just say hi glenn or something like that you know just so i know that you're actually talking they probably to don't me. even know who you are they're probably just that's right. Yeah, that's right yeah that's right you just get the email yeah it's probably not even addressed to you glenn it's probably just hi aussie decades yeah, yeah, I know. But you know, you know what I mean. Everyone gets these sort yeah. of emails. But just put my name in it and uh, we're all good. All right. Well, I'm waiting for my new product to come still. What is that? The Jammy Guitar. I'm oh. still waiting for it. Remember me telling you about it? It's yeah. a, it was a startup company and I invested That's about right. 500 bucks into it. And, and they keep they said it was going to be January and then they said it was going to be February. I invested. I ordered it back in December. I'm still waiting for it. Well, I, I invested 500 into Ripple. I'm still waiting. <laughs> oh, the price of Ripple has dropped so much now. It's oh, like has, has it up. Seen something like that. Mm. Also, Bitcoin. Bitcoin's fallen through the floor as well. Unless you weren't that guy that died this week that left 260-odd million dollars in his account and died with his password and they can't refund it. Oh, yeah. Did you, see, did you hear about that? Yeah. So what happens there? Who, who gets that money? Is it just... Nobody. <laughs> it just stays in the... in the Stays in the system. Cyber coins. Wow. They should invent like a mining, uh, uh, like a, a Bitcoin mining to mine the coins that are yeah. definitely there that nobody can have anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know. That's crazy. Well, they should it? have a, a way to donate them to charity or something. There, should, there shouldn't be mm. a way to leave it there. I think yeah, you got to, the moral of the story is you've got to tell someone your password, all right? Or, or do something when you die. If you get hit by a bus, people have to move on. But if you had $260 million sitting in, in an account somewhere, would you give someone your password? Oh, yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, maybe give it, put in a safe under lock and key. Maybe a and, safe with a key and an encrypted X yeah. marks spot yes. and some clues and some, if you find this, you'll find that and you can set up like a, a full or, event with your family. After or get the die. password tattooed on the inside of your butt cheek or something. So the only way that they're going to see the password is when you die and they have to Open up. So, so when the uh, the autopsy guy comes in and he's you know reads it, you know. Well, you got to you got to tell. Like, oh, it's a winner. <laughs> you got to you got to you got to tell one of your kin. You got to be first to to, to uh, split me bum open. <laughs> <laughs> 
and have a look there's for the that, password. There's that YouTube email. I just heard it. <laughs> yeah, good on him. All right, let's get out of here. All right, guys, uh, thanks for coming in. It's been a bit of a long show this week, but hopefully you enjoyed it. Thanks on the Facebook. Any comments on Facebook that, are, that we need to address? Or um, right, we can just go through them after the show anyway, if we need to. Uh, but if... if Someone's looking at Facebook. Tell me before I before we wrap up, and that'd be good. So, no, um, nothing there. nothing there. Yep, cool. All right. So, thanks Facebook for for having us, and, and uh, make sure you send Ian an email or a chat or something on his go far. Yeah, I will. I'll say, Ian, is this really you? All right. <laughs> good on you, everyone. <laughs> uh, have a good week. What is it? The seventh of February. What, nothing happening exciting this week. Valentine's Day next Thursday. Will I be here? Is it oh, Thursday? Dear, oh dear. Oh. We're gonna, we might be. Are we, we going to have a Valentine's Day special, are we? I don't know. Does anyone do Valentine's Day this year? Uh, anymore? I don't know. It's a bit hard. I gave it? up smoking on Valentine's Day 2006. Right. Good work. That's, that's got to be worth something, doesn't it? I still feel like a cigarette. Yeah, right. They say, uh, I, I knew a guy that was a smoker and he'd given up and he says, you know, you, you never, once you smoke, you never become a non-smoker. You're just a smoker that chooses not to smoke. Pretty much, yeah, right. Although yeah. I don't, you don't have the cravings anymore, but you could definitely suck like one the back. The amount of times I've walked past someone who smokes and it stinks, I go, oh, oh man, yeah. come on, piss off, you yeah. know. But at the same time, I was I was at the Arias one year, for just a bit of fun, and I pinched someone's cigarette and I had a cigarette. So in that time between 2006 and 2019, I did have one about halfway. Yeah, I was. I probably had a few other drinks. As yeah. well, well, one's not going to kill you. A bit, a, bit, a bit lenient to the rule because I'd had a couple. <laughs> um, I did. Yeah, I did. Well, one's not going to kill you. And I loved it. And I remember enjoying every second of yeah. it. Going, I can. Rem- it's the only thing I remember about the night. Actually, <laughs> oh, you don't remember getting that award? <laughs> don't remember getting. No, I remember. I can remember walking the red carpet and seeing all the celebs and stuff. And yeah, and then, yeah, pushing the girls and away. This, and the cigarette. That's it. Yeah, yeah, good stuff. I did actually walk the red carpet. I, I, I I'm not fibbing. I did. Hmm. I don't know how we scored that. The cigarette or the red carpet? <laughs> no, the red the red carpet holiday. Well, my booking agent has a table at the Aries. I did at that time have a table at the Aries every year, so he could pick a few of the musos that worked for him and take them along. So, yeah, right. All right. It's just lucky. Cool. All so, right. Thanks, guys. We'll uh, have a good week. Make sure you get your loved one a nice bunch of flowers or something that uh, that will endear you to them. Uh, and so until next week and the next time, it's a bye from us all. Bye, Joe. See you next week. See you, Glenn. Thanks bye. for coming. Bye, Jordan. See you next week. And we'll see you guys next week. Maybe guys. it's Valentine's Day. I'll have to let you know the last minute. If I'm going to get in trouble, on it, I'll let you know. <laughs> I'll be here. Yeah. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll find out who's more important, partners or Aussie tech heads. See you we'll next find week. Out next week. <laughs> Go on. Bye-bye.